Hi everyone, and welcome to Voice of Geekdom. This is the latest video in a continuing series which examines the text of J.R.R. Tolkien's The Silmarillion. You can find a link to the entire playlist in the description. Don't forget to leave this video a like to help the channel out, and leave your comments and questions for me below. And if you're not already subscribed, make sure to hit the big red button below, as well as the bell icon to activate notifications. Last time, we met Thingol, the future king of the Sindar Elves, and Melian the Maya of the race of the Ainur. We saw how the two of them came under an enchantment that froze them in time in the depths of the forest of Nan Elmoth. As we said at the beginning of the previous chapter, before departing over the sea, the elves had gathered in Beleriand, which is the lands around the mouth of the river Sirion. The Noldor and Vanyar have settled further to the west and close to the forest lands, while the Teri are inland, further east near the Blue Mountains and around the river Gelion. The Teleri are the largest of the three groups, and their numbers meant that they were slower to migrate westward. Many of the Teleri have also splintered off from the main group during the journey. We'll hear more on these groups later in the book. Olmo, the Lord of Waters, comes to the shore of Middle-earth to greet the elves, and the music which he made for them on his horns of shell turned their fear of the ocean which they had never seen before, into desire. Desire to see the holy land of Valinor. Olmo is here to grant that desire. He uprooted an island which long had stood alone amid the sea, far from either shore since the tumults of the fall of Iluin, and with the aid of his servants he moved it as it were a mighty ship and anchored it in the Bay of Balar, into which Sirion poured his water. It is quite a striking image of this island being forcibly relocated by the Valor of the Oceans like this. Or at least most of it. Part of the island breaks off while in transit, and becomes a permanent offshore geographical feature. The Isle of Balar. So, the Vanyar and the Noldor elves embarked for Aman, and are ferried across the water on Olmo's floating island. The Teleri, meanwhile, missed the boat, so to speak. Their king, Thingol, is still missing, deep in the forest of Nan Elmoth, as we heard in the previous chapter, and his people are out there looking for him, or waiting around for him when the summons comes from Olmo and the Valar. When they realised that they had missed their ride across the ocean, Olwe takes over as king, that's Thingol's brother, remember, and they relocate to the coastlands that the Noldor and the Vanyar had recently vacated. When they get there, they are met by the two Maiar, Ose and Uenen, Olmo's vassals. You may remember these two from that short bit that we got about to them on the earlier Rebellion of Ossé, from the Valaquenta chapter, when Melkor briefly tempted him to his service. That all seems to have been forgiven at this point though. Ossé instructed the Teleri, sitting upon a rock near to the margin of the land, and of him they learned all manner of sea lore and sea music. Thus it came to be that the Teleri, who were from the beginning lovers of water, and the fairest singers of all the elves, were after enamoured of the seas, and their songs were filled with the sound of waves upon the shore. Eventually, Olmo returns at the beckoning of the Noldor. You may remember in the previous chapter that Finwë, the king of the Noldor, was great friends with Thingol before he went missing. Thingol was en route to visit Finwë when he was lost in Nan Elmoth. Olmo invites the Teleri elves to journey once more across the ocean with him, upon the island which he had dragged all the way back from Aman with him 
after dropping off his first set of passengers. This is where we see a further sundering of the Teleri take place. This was after the other groups who didn't make it all the way into Beleriand have already broken off from the main host. Those who were closest to Thingol, their former king, stay in Beleriand and dwelt in the woods and hills rather than by the sea, which filled them with sorrow. They regret not passing into the west and mourn for the light of the trees, which they will never see. These forest-dwelling elves who stayed behind are the elves of Middle-earth who will later become the Sindar, and are ruled over by King Thingol when he and Melian eventually wake up from their shared state of enchantment. The other Teleri subculture which forms is those who became closest to Ose the Maiar during that time, the Falathrim, who inhabit the region which becomes known as the Phalas. The name Phalas translates from the literal Sindarin for seashore. Their leader is the legendary Círdan the Shipwright. This is the same Círdan who appears in the final chapter of The Lord of the Rings when Frodo and Bilbo accompany Gandalf and the elves back across the ocean and into the west. The Teleri on the island journeying across the sea, meanwhile, eventually beg for Olmo to stop the island when it begins to draw close to its destination, after they realised that Ose was following and calling out to them. Olmo granted their request, and at his bidding Ose made fast the island and rooted it to the foundations of the sea. Olmo did this the more readily, for he understood the hearts of the Teleri, and in the council of the Valar, he had spoken against the summons, thinking that it were better for the elves to remain in Middle-earth. This becomes the island's final resting place in the Bay of Eldamar, just off the coast of Oman. It comes to be known as Tol Eresea, the Lonely Isle. In an apparent nod to Arthurian legend, the capital of Tol Eresea is Avalone, an unusually unsubtle allusion to the mythical island of Avalon, where the sword Excalibur was forged and where Arthur arrived after he was fatally wounded in his final battle with Sir Mordred. In 1951, just prior to the publication of The Lord of the Rings, Tolkien writes in a letter to the editor Milton Waldman which is reproduced at the beginning of recent editions of The Silmarillion, that to Bilbo and Frodo, the special grace is granted to go with the elves they loved, an Arthurian ending, he calls it. And later on, he adds that it is hinted that they come to Eresea, further highlighting that connection to Arthur's Avalon. In this same letter, Tolkien complains that I was from early days grieved by the poverty of my own beloved country. It had no stories of its own bound up with its tongue and soil, not of the quality that I sought and found as an ingredient in legends of other lands. This grievance was what motivated Tolkien to begin writing the stories that formed the early Book of Lost Tales, which later became the Silmarillion a mythology for England. If we get back to Olmo's moving island here, in the Book of Lost Tales version, Eresea was England itself, they were one and the same. Later redrafts saw mainland Beleriand instead splinter into separate islands at the end of the First Age and then go on to become the British Isles before Tolkien eventually abandoned completely the idea of establishing a geographical continuity between the created world of the Silmarillion and the real world, following the publication of The Lord of the Rings, where finally the connection to England is preserved most strongly in the land of the Shire and the Hobbits. But we should get back to the actual 
published version of the Silmarillion. The Teleri dwell here on Tol Erisea for seemingly a number of years, and turn it into a beautiful country in its own right. Indeed, the Valar decide to create a wide gap through the Pelori Mountains, through which the light of the trees was allowed to shine out onto Erisea's western shore, through that valley, and permitting for the first flowers east of the mountains to bloom on the island. That gap in the mountain wall, the Kalakirya, also then becomes populated. The Vanyar and Noldor, who have now been in Valinor for some years, we presume, establish the city of Tyrion upon the hill of Tuna, there in that valley, basking in the light of the trees. Eventually, the elves on Tol Erisea finally decide to complete their long journey to Valinor. They were torn between the love of the music of the waves upon their shores, and the desire to see again their kindred, and to look upon the splendour of Valinor. But in the end, desire of the light was the stronger. To conclude the movements of the Vanyar and Teleri, what happens is that the Vanyar migrate to live closer to Manwe and Varda. Ingwe, their king, even moves into Manwe's palace, apparently, while the Teleri, having moved from the mainland, form a new coastal city further north, far outside the confines of the mountain wall, and away from the city of the Valar. Alqualonde, it was called. Part of the reason for these migrations of populations was due to Tolkien's original premise for these stories. He felt that he had to establish an historical backdrop for his created languages, i.e. the various forms of Elvish. In the Legendarium's formative years, as the language family evolved, so did the storyline. Their halls were of pearl, and of pearl were the mansions of Olwe at Alqualonde, the haven of the swans, lit with many lamps. For that was their city, and the haven of their ships, and those were made in the likeness of swans, with beaks of gold and eyes of gold and jet. The gate of that harbour was an arch of living rock sea-carved, and it lay upon the confines of Eldamar, north of the Kalakirya, where the light of the stars was bright and clear. We see here that the conflict between the love of the stars and the love of the sea remains a dichotomy for the Teleri Elves. Bear two things in mind here, though. First, all Elves love the stars, the Teleri included and we will see, by the end of the Quenta Silmarillion, the importance of stars as a source of hope and as a symbol of the power of the Valar. The Teleri simply love the ocean just as much. The ocean which echoes still the music of the Ainur. Second, remember that back in Chapter 3, Olmo was reluctant to relocate the elves to Valinor, in contrast to his other colleagues, despite the fact that here he is dragging islands around to taxi them across the ocean. As we will see over the course of the next few chapters, he may have been right to object to this plan, though. The Teleri, by tarrying in Middle-earth, splintering into factions along the way, reluctantly entering Valinor at the end of the journey, and even then finally settling outside of the reach of the light of the trees, and closer to the ocean, may have been doing a good thing, and actually have been acting more in accordance with the plans of Iluvatar in doing so. So now that we've covered the movements of the Teleri and the Vanyar, finally we come to our main protagonists, the Noldor. The Noldor, who were ruled by King Finwë, are introduced at length here. This is a section that many first-time readers will struggle with, so as is my task, 
I'll try to break this down and make it a little more digestible. Finway, who we have already been introduced to, is the patriarch of the ruling house of the Noldor. Finway had three sons, and two daughters, by two different wives. We will hear the story of what happened to his first wife, Miriel, in the next chapter. Feanor, the eldest son, is an all-important character, who will be introduced properly in the next chapter too, so we may as well wait until we get there to talk about him in more depth. Feanor has two half-brothers though, Fingolfin and Finarfin. These three brothers become the de facto heads of three separate houses within the Noldor's ruling family. Although Feanor was the eldest brother, Fingolfin's house will contain the line of the High Kings of the Noldor once they return to Middle-earth. His children were Fingon, Turgon, and Arathel. Finarfin, the third brother, was the father of Finrod Felagund, who becomes a very important elf lord later on, who has many interactions with the fathers of men when they show up, and also his sister Galadriel. Yes, that Galadriel. She doesn't play a very big role in the Silmarillion, but we will see her show up from time to time, and it is, of course, interesting to note her movements and actions at this time in history, to better understand the character that we see later in The Lord of the Rings. There are several other characters who are named here for the first time in this chapter, but rather than spend a lot of time running through every single one, I wanted to add a note or two here about the formation of the various names in the Silmarillion, and offer some general advice about remembering them. My advice is, don't even try to make lists to memorise them all. Instead, pay close attention to the way that the character names are presented to us by the narrative whenever we get them. Whenever the meaning is given for a specific name, it is probably worth thinking about what that name is telling us about the character, which in turn helps with committing it to memory. Sometimes names are just given to something or someone, simply to mark an event. We had several good examples of this back in Chapter 3. For example, when Orome first discovered the elves, we heard that he named them in their own tongue Eldar, the people of the stars. And this is because their race was born into the world under the light of the stars, and the stars were the first things that they saw when they awoke. Similarly, here when we are introduced to Feanor, we are told that his spirit burned as a flame. We're skipping ahead a little here, but in the next chapter of Feanor and the Unchaining of Melkor, we are told that his name literally means Spirit of Fire, and as we get to know this character, we will see that the name is quite a fitting one. But that's enough etymology for now. The Noldor, during this period of history, are spending a lot of time with our old friend Aule the Smith. This should come as no surprise, since we know that they have a lot in common, namely their love of craftsmanship and sub-creation. This is the same desire to create, incidentally, that we were told way back in the Valar Quenta that Aule and Melkor have in common. The Noldor learnt much from Aule in those days. Great became their knowledge and their skill, yet even greater was their thirst for more knowledge, and in many things they soon surpassed their teachers. The Noldor range further afield, and explore much more of the continent of Aman than the other groups. A certain restlessness is implied here, as well as that unquenchable thirst for knowledge which we know is part of their culture. The memory of Middle-earth under the stars 
remained in the hearts of the Noldor, and they abode in the Kalakirya, and in the hills and valleys within sound of the western sea. Many of them went often about the land of the Valar, making far journeys in search of the secrets of land and water and all living things. Next time we will meet Feanor and his brothers, and Melkor returns once again from his long incarceration in the Halls of Mandos. <laughs>